Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure the mics can handle all this <laughs> star power. I know, right? No, or the education, <laughs> hey. education on this. No, no, no. Side, and then we know, introduce so. Wayne and Aura, and I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm just trying to keep up with this guy. The Cost of Goods Told podcast is made possible by the following sponsors: Duke's Premium Meats Home Delivery is committed to providing you with the best quality meat delivered right to your door, offering certified Angus beef, grass-fed beef, Wagyu, and many more premium options. Nobody beats Duke's Meats. Make sure to check out all that Duke has to offer at dukespremiummeats.com. Chriswell Culinary aims to create a new standard of unique, affordable hot sauces that satisfies the more developed cravings of today. Bernie Brand Texas Style Hot Sauce is a boldly layered sauce with density and personality to proudly represent Texas. Go to berniebrand.com to find a retailer near you. That's Bernie, B-O-E-R-N-E, brand.com. Zero Point Organics grows and supplies microgreens for over 30 major restaurants in the Houston area. Consistently perfect quality in flavor and appearance, their microgreens will be the best you or your customers have ever had every single time. Go to zero, Z-E-R-O, dash pointorganics.com. Welcome to the Cost of Goods Told podcast. My name is Connor. I'm a chef and media producer. I am joined, as always, by Darren Lafferty, my co-producer. Happy Super Bowl. Yeah, I, not watching any of it, man. Do not care. Lame. Yeah, I know. Go Red Team. Go ahead. Go, <laughs> <Red Team. laughs> go Sports. I'm in it for the commercials. I mean, really. There you yeah. go. There's no Texas teams involved, so I'm, I'm going to go for the commercials. <laughs> Well, this is uh, a special podcast uh, for many reasons. One, it is the end of season two, um, kind of coming full circle, uh, especially with uh, Ara being here, Ara from Harlem Road, Texas Barbecue, uh, who was guest number one um, when we had literally one subscriber to the podcast, <laughs> and that fool was me. I you think know? that was you, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thick and thin. He's been through yeah. with thick and thin with us. Thick and thin, especially uh, if you go back and watch the video version of it and you see how janky that setup was with my computer and everything. And now <laughs> we've actually grown much and thanks to you, Darren. Um, we've got a special guest on, a guy who comes with uh, a lot of expertise. Um, I've got something written down here. I hope it's okay. Uh, I said, the Pope of Barbecue and the Temple of Taylor from the Cathedral of Smoke in the Vatican State of Brisket, Wayne Mueller. How you doing, sir? <laughs> How do you feel wow. about that, Wayne? <laughs> in the name of the salt, pepper, and holy smoke, <laughs> yeah. dig in. Well, How are you guys so doing? How is everyone? Thanks for great. having me. Absolutely. Man. Thank you for making time, carving time out. Uh, oh, it's my pleasure. visit with us. Oh, it's great. This is awesome. I'm uh, actually extremely excited. I've been thinking about how I would think this podcast would go and i think maybe it will be in part two um because i think part one we're gonna you know take time hear your journey if anybody hasn't heard it you know tales of the pits did a wonderful job of, of doing it in a, in a two-part series and i think it was great um there's a bunch of other podcasts so we may get the condensed version because i know that there's going to be other things besides you know the history of louis Mueller barbecue uh that we'd like to get to but i do think it's awesome that we've got two guys who come with a ridiculous amount of expertise, a ridiculous amount of craftsmanship uh, from kind of opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, and so I've kind of got some leading questions that I think will, will hopefully spark some good conversation that will be both barbecue related and just kind of life and industry related um, because we've got guys kind of from opposite ends of the spectrum, if, if you know that's fair to say. So. Um, Wayne, if you don't mind uh, just kind of starting us off, I know we've got a lot of history to cover, but, you know, if, if, if you don't mind just kind of taking us back to uh, step one. with <laughs> It was a cool autumn morning on September 28th, 1965. Start as, your, as an indentured servant. <laughs> well, it was shortly after my birth that the indentured servitude began. Yeah, yeah um, my father in 1974 who was working for his father, who was a grocer primarily, but also had a barbecue restaurant. My father was a butcher. Um, he had just returned from Korea and was trying to decide what he wanted to do with life. And my grandfather said, you're gonna work <laughs> for me, <laughs> for cheap. And I think the indentured servitude started there, at least passed the down. generational aspect of it. Yeah. And my grandfather decided to, to hang up his, his commercial apron in 74, my father decided, I don't, I don't want to do the grocery thing. 
the box stores are just dominating the market, it's, it'll be too difficult. I don't know. I'll do the restaurant. So yeah. he chose to do the restaurant and he drug me along with him. <laughs> he needed some labor and I was cheap <laughs> and I couldn't say no. You'd work for food? Yeah, well, no, he wouldn't let me eat there. Oh my goodness. <laughs> no, I could not eat the food. That was, that was prepared for the, the guest. Okay. My grandfather actually sort of gave me a, a, a sideways hack and said, here's, here's what you can do with some bread. You know, <laughs> and, and, you know, he had me strain the onions off of our beef dip, you know, uh, and sort of fold it over. And he goes, that'll tide you over. So that's you'll what, get used to the heat. Don't so worry about it. Pro tips. Pro tips has been around a long time. Long time. <laughs> There's always ways around everything. I'm sure. And Grandpa was kind enough to show me his. That's you awesome. Know? Um, so I worked there. Menial sort of stuff, as, as you would expect. Cleaning floors, bathrooms, taking out trash, washing dishes making sure the dining room was set properly. You know, I did that for a number of years. Probably I was around nine, that was eight when I started. When I was about nine, nine and a half, I started twisting sausage for dad. Hmm. And I wasn't tall enough yet to see over the backsplash on the table. So he would, Coke crates were, were all wooden back then. So you could stand <laughs> on them without any problem. Uh, he stacked a couple of them up and I would stand on those crates and he had tape. On, taped up on the backsplash with two marks the length of a, a link of sausage nice. and he said that's your mark hit it yeah and that's pretty much what it was really? he was like yep yeah. you better do it right <laughs> otherwise you don't get shoes <laughs> wow. you, you know so i started sausage then and really i think the greatest thing my grandfather and father impl imparted on me was besides a work ethic that was you know you're just going to do this because yeah it's what we do. You're the oldest child and you get well, to lead I mean, the way. Well, I mean, but, you know, small town America, if you owned a farm, if your family owned a farm or a ranch, what do you, if you were kids, if you're old enough to carry a pail, yep. you're milking a cow. Sure. <laughs> I mean, because everybody had to pitch in. I yep. mean, that's part of the reason to have the family yep. is to make it, make your whole life livable. Right. Um, and small towns, independent businesses, same way. I mean, it, they were leading in the late, mid to late 19th, 20th centuries was still that way. Today, it's a little different, I think. Yeah. Um, but they imparted on me that work ethic is one of the things. But they also were not fearful just to talk about things and challenges and problems and successes and things that they do and things that they've learned and things that they would advise you to avoid. And they're talking amongst each other. You just get to be the beneficiary of, right. of listening. You're the sounding a true, board. A you true didn't apprenticeship know is about listening and yeah. watching for a long time to get comfortable with everything that goes on. Almost create, it's almost like watching TV in a way because you're seeing all the action. You're not involved in it, right. but you're learning it. Mm -hmm. Then when you do it, yes, you have your uncertainties about it because you're fumbling through it. There's no muscle memory, but at least you have some idea of what the process is and what it entails. Right. Yeah, so, being that fly on the wall, right? Right, yeah. and, and it's invaluable. Yeah. I can't tell you how much you glean from that and you don't even realize that you do until you try and, or attempt to train people who haven't had that and realize just what they don't know. And it's massive. Things you take absolutely for granted, they don't know. Right. So um, that's, a, that's a tough learning exercise. Sure. But, but that all helped prepare me, I think, in a way first to leave. And I did, and the first train I could get out, I was gone. My father was very supportive of me going. He gave me the blessing, which made it all the more easier to, to take off. Um, but it also, he developed me that, you know, you don't have to be smarter. You don't have to be better. You just have to care more. In other words, you, if you're, if your work ethic is such, you're going to outwork most people that you're in competition with. Mm -hmm. And in that process, you're going to learn more and you're going to be more adept and more in tune. And you're going to have more nuance available to you than they are, because you're just going to have more exposure than yep. anybody else doing hour for hour, what you're doing your career will advance. I didn't realize that until I got into it. And then you start noticing that it's so true. Why am I, why am I doing better than him? Mm -hmm. He is equally in, in every way. Or why am I doing better than her? She, in some ways, may be better than me in some things. Right. How does that happen? And it, I think it all just comes down to real true effort and caring. And I think so you, hit, you hit the nail on the head by saying caring is most people don't care or they're in it for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Being in it for the wrong reasons, it yeah. will burn you out in this industry. Oh yeah. More in than our, any other. Yeah. If you're not in it for the right reason, if you're not in it for the love of what you're doing, 
it will it, it is the one industry I know will chew you up and spit you out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's it'll hard. Kill, literally kill you. Yeah, yeah, it's a hard life. It's a hard life. Yeah, um, which is why my father was like, "Yeah, you don't you don't need to do this." We didn't go on vacations. We uh, we didn't have much time together. When I saw my father, it was a blessing that I worked after school and on weekends because that's when I saw my father. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't see him otherwise. So we didn't get a chance to go play ball in the backyard. We didn't get a chance to go on vacation. We didn't have many opportunities to go even to a ball game. They were very, very few. And you cherish those moments when they happen. Yeah. I don't think we ever saw a ball game where the team we were rooting for won. It was a <laughs> calamity. Yeah. It was a Rodney Dangerfield moment. <laughs> a lot of them. Yeah. You know? But it wasn't for a lack of effort. My dad was, you know... I, th- I feel that he was so unappreciated in his time. Um, I really feel that my mission today, as it is every day, is to bring more light to his contribution to what we do, not just to Louis Miller Barbecue, but to the industry as a whole. Yeah. How m- many of the nuances and actions and, I think, settings come right back to him. Yeah. Even if my grandfather set them in motion, when my father took over, he had every opportunity to change everything, and he chose not to. And I think that was the pure genius of, of his operations and his experience of, of what he wanted the guests to have. So I want you to be focused not just on how great the food is or how good the service is. I want you to be also be absorbed by the aesthetic, right. the environment that you're in. My father's decision not to change a thing and to stay organic um, was brilliant in and of itself. It's a, hmm, it's a fucker to keep, keep it up and running. I'm sure. It really is. I mean, old buildings are a blessing and a curse. <laughs> this one's 120 years old, and it acts 200, <laughs> if that's possible. Yeah. So are you describing me or the building? Uh, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is all building. I'm, or maybe me. <laughs> um, that building will age you. But there's something that's, I heard tales that during Augustus' reign, um, that even then on the Capitoline Hill, there were the first, there was the first hut of Romulus, and it was a temple. By that time, it had to be 750, 800 years old. Mm-hmm. And it was a cherished mark of the city as the founding of the city. It wasn't a true cathedral or a temple where a god was worshiped, but Romulus was sort of deified. He was a demigod amongst the Roman people for bringing them what they have. Yeah. And in a way, I look at 206 West 2nd Street <laughs> as that temple to, uh, you know, to Bobby and, and to, to maybe not quite as great extent to Louis. They both had e- immense parts to play. But I think that that's truly an ode to them. Well, you know? It sounds like just, and just from the brief readings that I've done and, and your brief description, the cliff notes that you've given us, is that your dad understood and lived and breathed how difficult that business could be so much to the tune that he said, please go off and don't do this, right? Go, oh, yeah. go get an education. Sure. He goes, you have a brain, go use it. <laughs> Pretty simple. He was probably Thanks, a man dad. of few words, but, but that oh, was, that's all you needed, that, right? You, that's you know, all you needed. When, I, I, my dad, a man of few words. That's an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> I start, I, you know, when I was in college, I, I smoked for a brief while. And the first time I smoked around my parents, it's one of those, you know, I can only imagine um, other instances where you come out and show a piece of yourself to your parents that they don't know. <laughs> um, my dad was unfazed completely. He had quit smoking years before, but he just asked me a simple question. And it was, you know, since when did you become a green piece of wood? And I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, what happens to a green piece of wood? I said, it smokes. He goes, yeah. And, and I'm like, oh, I guess I'm pretty freaking stupid. Yeah, dad, I got it. Dad would talk to me, metaphors, similes. That's how he communicated yeah. with me. And what I've learned, even though he didn't, he was a very conservative communicator, didn't speak a whole lot, very introverted. He found that using a base experience as a simile or a metaphor that most people experience that he could communicate to people in such a way that they all understood what he was saying in a rudimentary form, um, which I think highly technical or academically inclined individuals Mm -hmm. may talk over the head of people and they don't get it and they never get it. Right. 
I've learned that, you know, th- there's a better way to tell a story to get people to understand what you're doing. And I learned that from him. It's, so that's what I do. It sounds like it promoted intelligence, but it also promoted the ability for people who spoke over you to dumb down a little bit and say, hey, here's the example that I'm using. Can you figure this out? Well, I mean, if you talk about a river, how many people have been to some body of water that's a, a moving body of water yeah. in their life at some yeah. point? Mm-hmm. You know, not counting this current gener- generation that never leaves the house. I'm sure they've seen one on TV. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so the experience level there is almost ubiquitous. That's something everybody can draw on. Right. So why not use things that they can relate to that aspect sure. of life? Sure. sure. Then you're speaking a language. It doesn't matter. You know, you're, it's not the language. It's not the verbiage that you're using that's conveying the, the message you're trying to make. It really is what's mm-hmm. happening and what they can relate to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, your dad had a significant period of time working under your grandfather. No. Or working with or no? No. Okay. He worked with Fred Fontaine for a number of years. Okay. Fred Fontaine was the manager of the restaurant from 1959 until 1974. Okay. So he had already logged in about 15 years of cooking there before my father got there. When my father returned from um, the army from Korea, it was in 1963. And he then went and worked as a butcher for the next seven years. So he really cut his, his teeth in the butchery in the meat market long before ever coming over to the restaurant. Okay. He was making sausage then. The sausage recipe we have is his. Um, I've made a few alterations, adding some peppers or whatever, but the base recipe is his, 100%. Okay. Um, and so much of what he knows about cooking, he both picked up from Fred and brought with him, just as I brought with me, because he was down there with my grandfather. They were cooking from 1946 on in the alleyway behind the grocery store. Right. He was right there in the thick of it. Yeah. So he was just like me. He had his responsibilities from the time I think he was nine. Right. He started working around. Um, and just, I swear to God, my, my experience in, in my way, in my time, exper- really mirrors and mimics his. So I understood what he understood from that perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, it took me a while. I mean, I had to be an adult. I had to leave and come back before I understood that perspective. Sure. But I, I could see his perspective on many things. And it was, um, it was really his techniques that I think helped stabilize the consistency of our food over time. Mm-hmm. Um, the introduction of wrapping briskets to hold them, that was a dad thing. Um, he and my grandfather... That was, you know, brisket was, was a gra- my grandfather's thing. Fred didn't want to do it. He didn't think anybody would buy it. He literally got threatened with his job to start cooking it, you know, and it was begrudgingly. <laughs> but the pit that we had, the brick pit, was mm-hmm. built for that. Hmm. So it's like, no, you're going to cook this. Yeah. <laughs> right? We're, this is going to replace Claude. It's got more fat. We can cook it quicker. It's a better carving ex- experience. It's just, it'll give us a better experience and the price point's the same. So yeah. we're going to do this. And now Packers will send us whole cases of this at a time. <laughs> we don't have to rely just on the sides of beef that we're breaking down every week. Sure. Mm-hmm. We'll never be able to supply it. So we're going to stabilize the menu. We're going to do this. And, um, you know, I, Fred did a really good job of being an extrovert and promoting the business with the people who came in. He did a good job cooking the food. And he was consistent cooking the food. And he built relationships with a lot of people that came in. Um, and my father took that base and improved upon it. What he gave to me was this pristine thing. Um, and in some ways, I was forced to make some changes because they were better for the outcome. Every person, if you, you can't take a single link out of that chain and have this chain be unbroken and, and there not be, we, we wouldn't be here. Right. You can't take any one of those individuals out of this position, no matter what my personal feelings are of any of them, yeah. mm-hmm. and say, oh, this would be here or would be what it is without it. They all played their part. They all had their contribution to mm-hmm. make. Mm-hmm. And without any of them, there would be none of this. So I truly stand on the shoulders of all these men, um, and I am proud to do so. And it's hard work. And I appreciate their efforts more and more every day because they had to sell themselves out for this. Yeah. All of them. It didn't matter who they were. And there was just few of them. I feel like the Dallas Cowboys in a way. (laughs) 
I feel you, had Tom, you had Tom Landry, <laughs> you know, up until 89. All the, what, 29 years of the Cowboys history, you had one coach. Yeah. Right? Um, and then you have this cascading of coaches. Well, you know, for this entire period, you have my, really, Fred, my dad, as that head coach. Yeah. And I come in, and then, you know, I've had a number of people come in and come and go under me. <laughs> but the industry has changed so much since then. Oh, too. yeah. Mm-hmm. 2009, 2010, the industry changed. And I just happened to be right there with it. So yeah. I was forced to make a lot of changes, uh, adapt to what was happening in, in the industry and in the market. Um, I think dad would approve, but there's no way, there's no guarantees on that. There's a lot of things he and I talked about. There's a lot of things we agreed on, a lot of things we didn't. And how he would feel about all of this, I think he'd just be shocked and amazed that people even cared. Really? Yeah. Nobody cared before. I think he, the, the attention drawn on this, he would not have been comfortable with the celebrity of it. Mm. He wasn't comfortable with even talking to people then. Mm. So to be sort of this superstar now, uh, I, don't, I don't know how well he would adjust. Mm. He's just not that kind. So I don't know. So, so when you came back from college, you, you were sort of employed or asked to, and you were happy to jump in, back into the family business. Well, sort of. Sort of. Well, that's, that's kind of where I want to, you know, bec- because we have Ara here, and Ara was someone who was in, an, in the industry and then became drawn to barbecue and now has been in it for, is this year? Five. Five. Yeah. Year I five. love Ara. Yeah. No, <laughs> stop it. I love yeah. Ara. Ara now, is Most people don't amazing. realize, yeah, I've only been doing barbecue for only like four or five years. Right. That's it. He's amazing. So, but no, it's, stop it. It's, it's a little bit it's of a true. different path. You, you've talked about there's been something primal about barbecue, yeah. something that drew you to barbecue. The, you know, the, I, I always wonder what, like, when, when I was prepping for this podcast, I wondered what your first years or your, literally your first week doing it versus what your first week would be. Like, is there animosity? Is there anger? Is there, mm-hmm. hey, I, I was, <clears throat> you know, Major League Baseball, and I was, you know, doing this, you know, and uh, or my, I'm sorry, minor league uh, baseball, you know, managing and things like that, and all all of that sort of career for stuff. For me, having come from the fine dining background, it wasn't. I didn't ever look at. I'm also different than most chefs, <laughs> so I truly love what I do. The cooking, the hours, any of that stuff. I don't look at it as. Um, I care. I care about the food. I care about the history behind it. For me, it's all about. Putting love into the food. Why, why is Wayne's food so great? Is because he learned it from his dad. And the influences that he had, he was shown that care. Mm-hmm. Okay? Most chefs don't have that advantage. They've gone into the culinary school, they've apprenticed, and they get into it to become famous. Mm-hmm. I cook because I truly love to cook. So, and as far as barbecue goes, I didn't grow up in the, in the U.S. I grew up in Europe. Right. But every culture in the world has some sort of cooking with live fire and smoke. Right. Mm-hmm. So to me, that's like one of the true international recognizable languages anywhere in the world. Right. I don't care if you're in the deserts in Jordan, <laughs> you are in Australia, or you are in France. They all cook with fire and wood. And smoke. So it's one of those, or if you're in Japan, they, same. Right. Uh, so when I came into the barbecue world of cooking and what made me decide, I love Texas barbecue. To me, it is, it's got a very clean, it's amazing because it's just very simple, but it's time consuming. And when it's done right, it's phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Okay, because you have to have love to make it come out right. Otherwise, it's just another piece of meat smoked, right? And doing it commercially on a larger scale, you know, it's fine when you're doing, that's our blessing and our curse in our industry in barbecue is that everybody in Texas does barbecue in their home, in their backyard. So they're all hey, I make the best brisket because my entire family loves it. Right. So they're an expert, <laughs> right? But when you do one brisket, 
compared to 100. Right. It's a completely different story. What? Yeah. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> yeah, and make every one of them come out exactly the same. Yeah. Yep. Right. Yeah, that's 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 the blessing and the curse of in our business, right? Mm-hmm. You know, there's there seems to be this unspoken animosity between the competitive circuit and and the commercial circuit. <laughs> that there's an understanding that somehow votes from a judging panel is somehow superior to judging from foot traffic that comes in your door. I always take the opposite position. You know, we don't have a week to prepare a single brisket or six slices of brisket. Right. You know, we've got hours to prepare thousands of pounds for hundreds of people every day. And they all have to say, yes, you, you win, you get my money. Right. Yeah. And, that, and, and that, 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 yeah. that's, that's, you want to know pressure and having people depend on you, yeah. having your staff, who have families, who are supporting their mothers, right? Yep. Who have sick relatives that they're, that they're literally subsidizing with their efforts. I mean, to me, there's a, there's a more human story there. Mm-hmm. That means more to me than a trophy. Well, yeah. I think the longevity that you just sp- spoke of, right, between what's, what's more important, a trophy or a repeat customer? Right, someone who can help you keep those lights on, someone who helps you stay there a year, two years, three years, and then pass it down uh, to family members. I think that speaks uh, much louder than a trophy that sits on the wall and collects dust. To me, I mean, it's about relationships. Barbecue is about stories and relationships. <laughs> At least it is to me, because that's even in my small little town where there was countless little barbecue joints. The top five or six, the largest ones. They all knew each other. They all talked to each other. They all had relationships. Mm-hmm. They all worked together. Somebody was short wood. Somebody was short brisket. Right. Somebody short people. They shifted stuff around. Mm. They made it happen. Yeah. They weren't going to allow their competition to go down. Craziest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> but everybody had their clientele, and nobody's clientele crossed over. It was the same way at the grocery stores at that time, which is why I think this mentality worked in Taylor at that time. Yeah. There was 15 grocery stores in a three-block radius of downtown. They're all there mm. to service clans and extended clans from people who have migrated there and had been there, you know, maybe going on their second or third generation, right. they were servicing them. And then they wound up servicing the migrant groups. But when that collapsed, there was no more, you know, strong relational or familial ties. Everybody's going for the cheapest dollar. Sure. And so the, what was established and worked before doesn't, doesn't work anymore. Yeah. I agree. Well, that's great. I think that that's a perfect uh, stopping point for part one. We'll be right back uh, after a word from our sponsors from Duke's Premium Meats, Zero Point Organics, and uh, Bernie Brand Hot Sauce. We'll be right back. The Cost of Goods Told podcast is made possible by the following sponsors. Chriswell Culinary aims to create a new standard of unique, affordable hot sauces that satisfies the more developed cravings of today. Bernie Brand Texas Style Hot Sauce is a boldly layered sauce with density and personality to proudly represent Texas. Go to BernieBrand.com to find a retailer near you. That's Bernie, B-O-E-R-N-E, Brand.com. Zero Point Organics grows and supplies microgreens for over 30 major restaurants in the Houston area. Consistently perfect quality in flavor and appearance, Their microgreens will be the best you or your customers have ever had every single time. Go to zero, Z-E-R-O-pointorganics.com. Duke's Premium Meats Home Delivery is committed to providing you with the best quality meat delivered right to your door. Offering certified Angus beef, grass-fed beef, Wagyu, and many more premium options, nobody beats Duke's Meats. Make sure to check out all that Duke has to offer at dukespremiummeats.com.